thing. So, um, you know, the, the title of this um, talk originally said, you know, decentralized GitHub, and I think that might be looking a little far into the future at the moment. <laughs> um, so right now we'd like to say it's a decentralized alternative for Git repos. Um, and I think, you know, a, a couple of developers or at least one of the developers is, is on this call too. So um, I was I was more of a, a cheerleader on this one, um, and, but I'm here, here to talk about it though. Um, one of the things that, you know, we want to clear up right away is that Git is already decentralized in and of itself, right? Um, and Git is awesome. Um, and, but what um, we get away from in Git is that we all switch to hosting it on a centralized server. Um, and that's because um, the ownership and, well, besides the collaboration parts, which are still great on GitHub, but the ownership and permission parts um, are, um, you know, something that DLT is really good at. And in the past, you would have required to have a centralized server like GitHub in, in between. Um, and if you're not using GitHub, then you might be using some uh, canonical repo within your organization as well. But again, it tends to be these centralized servers that are actually doing the, the ownership control of the of the Git repos. Um, and so we get this a lot. Um, you know, we were we were number one, or you know, we we're up there on Hacker News for about twelve hours, and uh, we got all these like, well, actually, you know, Git is already decentralized. Um, it's like, yeah, well, you know, thanks. Yes, we all we all know that. Um, and you can manage it fully decentralized using you know passing patch files around over anonymized email uh, when you're a small group. But if you're talking about you know large open source projects um, or something that you know might be handling value um, you know and value even in the crypto sense or even like you know something handling credit cards or something like that then you get into this um, idea of like you really need to actually have understandable ownership and um, uh, understandable ownership and accountability for what goes into that source repo um, and right now everyone again defaults to using these these centralized servers um, the way DGIT works, um, and again, you know, super early audience here. We're actually think we might have to change the name. DGIT was actually taken by um, uh, by a Debian a Debian package a while ago, Debian Git, um, and so we might be changing this to Decentral Git. But for now, we'll call it DGIT. Um, the way DGIT works is that it's a super simple install, like literally DGIT in it, and I'll actually just show that later. Um, but uh, and then DGate uses two different decentralized technologies um, to host the repo. So on one end, it uses Tupelo, um, which is what my team and I are building. Um, and Tupelo, is, which I'll talk about in a second, but Tupelo handles the ownership of the repo. So who's allowed to write to the repo? Um, and then Skynet, which is um, part of SIA, um, which is a decentralized storage network handles actually storing the, the Git objects. Um, now there might be some people on this who are on this call who are not like super knowledgeable about how Git works. So actually I should step back for a second. There might be people who don't know what Git is. <laughs> Git is a source control, is a version control system for developers. Um, and uh, it's a way to host your code and manage change processes on that code. Um, so dgit, what it does is it will, um, it'll, it uses Tupelo to have a canonical pointer to the Git repo, and it uses Skynet to store the underlying objects of the Git, so the actual source files um, and the you know the change history um, of that repo. Um, right now, you know GitHub is kind of awesome, right? And it has a lot of collaboration features. Um, and so what DGit is designed to do is to work next to GitHub. Um, so you, on your Git push, it'll push right to GitHub and then also to the decentralized um, networks. Um, now, you don't have to use GitHub. You can switch just to Git, but that's where, the way it is. And we also have built um, tooling to drop into GitHub so you can have a GitHub action actually pushing out updates to that repo too. Um, Tupelo, which I said um, handles the, um, the ownership of Git repos. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that many people on this call are not familiar with what Tupelo is. So Tupelo is a layer one platform, um, you know, layer one being similar to at the le protocol level of Bitcoin or Ethereum, but designed very differently. Um, it's designed for applications and real world, um, real world objects rather than being a money or decentralized finance. Um, so and it's designed the 
structure of it is very different than other systems as well, where we have this new data structure, it's called a chain tree. Um, and a chain tree is a blockchain of updates to an individual object, plus a tree of current state. Um, they, so can you get, can my, oops, sorry. Is my mouse visible when I move on these? Um, Actually, uh, I was concentrating on your underwear. <laughs> Internet guy. What's that? Internet guy. <laughs> um, right, so I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not, but the, the yellow section here of a chain tree um, has, it, it can be arbitrary data about an object. Um, and this chain is the history of, of updates to that tree. Um, I, I could talk forever about Tupelo, but this is about DGIT. But basically, um, if you understand how Git works, which is basically a tree already, it maps really well to this structure. Um, and I think the key thing to understand is that in Tupelo, there's not a blockchain. There's millions of blockchains for each individual object. And I think that's the key thing to understand. Um, and so we use one of these to represent your repo um, in DGIT. Um, and uh, so what, oops, what DGIT does is it creates a chain tree for you, so your user, um, which will have like your name and a key associated with it, and then also a, a chain tree for the repo itself. And then the repo itself, that's um, it stores metadata about the repo. So like what, um, you know, where are these, who owns it and who can update it um, as well, and then pointers to the actual large files, so your actual source code stored over, um, oh man, this keeps, well, that's actually good, stored over in Saya. <laughs> um, and Saya, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it, but it's, um, I keep saying guys and apologize. I don't know if you folks have heard of it, um, but it's a, um, it's a decentralized storage network. Uh, incentivized storage. So uh, the miners uh, are actually storing files. Um, they have probably, uh, they're gonna be crossing a petabyte stored on the system pretty soon. Um, and uh, it's, it's decentralized storage. Um, so you upload files and it's held there. It's, you know, held on the network. They recently released this new protocol called Skynet. Uh, which has some similarities to IPFS, but um, in some ways a little less decentralized, but in some ways a little more. So it depends on how you look at it. Um, but what Skynet lets you do um, is post files up to uh, a Skynet portal, they call it. That gives you a hashback, meaning that you can like address that file by its actual contents, then they can't be modified, um, and then stores it on the SIA network for you. Um, and any portal, any portal, any Skynet portal has access to all of the other Skynet portals. So it's decentralized um, in that anyone can write a Skynet node, including you, um, or you can use, I think there's six or seven public ones available now. Um, and that's kind of the decentralized de decentralization level of the actual like source storage that we're doing now. Um, and what excites me about DGIT is one, like the, the future possibilities of, of letting groups um, have their own source code and, and move away from centralized storage. I mean, in general, um, you know, I, we still use GitHub for our main workflow. Um, you know, if you're from Iran, you're not using GitHub for your, <laughs> for your centralized workflow. Um, and I think there's also just a lot of, of use cases there where you really want to have the the control live with your own organization rather than some centralized third party. And the future of DGIT, because it's on a DLT, allows all sorts of like, you know, we haven't built some of this stuff yet, but you can imagine, uh, you know, token owners of a, of a repository, like kind of like a DAO where you have to vote to merge PRs um, uh, or a Git repo that, um, you know, manages finances actually, right? It could be your solidity contract there that gets deployed automatically from this, um, uh, you know, from this repo that's owned by your DAO, um, as opposed to sitting in a in GitHub, which I always think is an is a weird thing, right? The the source code for all these things we're calling decentralized, someone's deploying those, right? <laughs> so who is doing that? Um, and what I think is really interesting about um, when you when you think about the the kind of 
metaphors or or the examples that um, dgit is starting to show here is that um, git repos are actually a really perfect example of a digital good. You can kind of think of that like a song or a video or a money, right? Like a, like an Ethereum token or a Bitcoin token. Um, but it's a it's a good that exists purely in the digital world, and DLTs are actually really perfect for that. And I think it kind of uh, I think this like GitHub existence actually exemplifies um, really well kind of what the DLT is all about. And it's not really all about finance. It's not all about you know kill the banks. It's really about you have these middlemen that used to be necessary in the in the old economy. Um, you, if you wanted to have trust between multiple partners uh, interacting in a digital way, you needed to have these centralized servers in the middle. Um, so you know you need the bank, you need the you need the GitHub, um, or you know you need some centralized land registry. Um, and all of those things were necessary before we came up with the concept of um, digital ownership um, and digital scarcity. Um, and I think that's what's kind of interesting here too is that when you think about a Git repo and what it actually is, it's a piece of information that should only exist in one spot um, that has rules about how it is changed, right? And that's and some of those rules could just be who is allowed, but it could be other rules as, to, as well too. Um, <clears throat> and I guess I, I already covered this, right? It's like that's that's what DLT is about, digital things that have rules about them and ownership about them and how they relate to people and organizations. And that's what I think is, is exciting about DGIT. Um, and a lot of people talk about um, open source in this kind of phrasing. It's like, um, why would you introduce digital scarcity to um, to a new economy of abundance, right? Where if you can have infinite forks of a repo, why would you go back and, and introduce some like old concept of, of scarcity? And I think to me that again is the wrong question. It's about, um, it's about control and also um, ease of use in like a very kind of macro level. It's about how, if I'm, if I'm gonna use a piece of software, how do I know which fork to use? And um, you know, if there's a million forks, how do I know? And then how do I know which ones were, which one am I gonna put my human trust in, right? Like in terms of I trust the developers or I, or I trust the security auditor um, or I trust the wisdom of the crowds. But if, there's, if we're just gonna have the abundance part, then I like the, atten the human attention is too spread out. Um, and we need to actually bring that back into a central place where we can, again, have these controls over um, understanding this is the canonical repo and it's the rules have been followed to create it. And you know, going back to our earlier conversation about Webboot, I think that's it's exactly that, right? It's like, we have the source code, we're gonna display something to users. How do users feel confident that the, the chain of ownership from concept in a person's head to display in a web browser um, uh, has that chain of trust that that you know I feel safe as a user using, um, and sometimes that could be just a stamp from a single developer, or it could also be you know you could think about concepts of um, uh, like staking or something like that too, right? Like if this was compiled wrong, then the someone's stake is wiped out, um, introducing economic security to it too. But all of that again is like stuff that we need to to think through together um, in as we talk about the uh, the next steps for DGIT. Um, it's super easy, um, and I'll just show it. Um, I'm not going to show the install though, but that's it, on a on a Mac. It's just brew tap form control DGIT install dgit and then dgit in it in a repo um, and actually i'll just do that right now um, you just get rickrolled if you use them though um, all right so is that big enough there all right so um i'm just gonna make a new um repo yeah it looks excellent um And we'll just add, we'll uh, first of all, just do a normal get in it. Um, and then we'll just uh, write something to the 
readme. Um, and then we'll add that and check it in. And then we'll just do d git in it. So, and we'll do and say yes to that. And we'll do. And if actually, if you start from a GitHub repo, that process is actually even simpler. You don't have to tell it what the name of it is, um, but just because this is not on GitHub at all, um, that's you have to type the name in there. And now we have actually pushed that up already. Um, and you can see that there's a, a dgit URL. So if we go over to, um, let me make that bigger also. I'm just gonna go to a new directory here and just do a normal git clone. And we cd into that. And we can do, and there's the thing that we did. So that's a fully decentralized workflow. Um, the, it's the, the chain tree on Tupelo um, in our testnet for now, but, um, and then on uh, Skynet, uh, for the actual source. And you can see just how easy that is. It's really just a, a push to a, a Git remote and it handles all of that for you. Um, and clones look just like normal clones. And you know you can go back and you can do, um, let's see, we'll um, we'll just change it just to show a normal workflow. So I'm going to push. GPT is just my git push. Oh, you know what? There's no origin. My, that's, sorry, that's why. <laughs> this is the demo gods here. OK, so the git push have worked. <clears throat> There we go. It did work. I was just impatient. It's a little slow, I guess, maybe because of my video streaming. Well, you know, we do call it alpha, but there it did come up. <laughs> there we go. So there's that has the change that we did. Um, so a little slower than we all want it to be in the future, but again, it could be my um, it could be my uh, video streaming here doing that. Um, the idea is that it actually doesn't really change your workflow at all. Um, that you can um, uh, that you can actually just um, you know work as you normally do, push and pull from a re repo that is now in Tupelo and Saya as opposed to GitHub. Um, you can help us build it. We actually, you have the dgit is hosted on dgit um, and also um, on uh, GitHub as well. And that's, pre that's my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions or talk about the, uh, the future of dgit or any features that people would love to see. So. Thank you so much for coming, Copper. This no, thanks for having me. It was, uh, it's, it's fun really to talk awesome. about stuff, so.